There were only two things could knock the Christian right off my mother, Florida and my daddy. Having grown up in Southern California, where apparently the citizens are all working on their third and fourth PhDs, she declared Florida one big piece of trailer park trash. My daddy was an alcoholic, a storyteller extraordinaire, a.k.a. a full gospel mountain of fire Bible quoting tent revival preacher. We were always in a car. Seems the better part of my childhood was spent with my father behind the wheel while my mother, my older sister, and brother and I sat dull-faced in some bald, tired, ozone-killing junker with the windows rolled down, our limbs sticking to the vinyl like tree frogs in August. My mother would wrap a mason jar full of ice water in a towel and stick it under her seat. When we reached a critical level of stupor, she'd bring it out to revive us. Holy water. We are mostly rolling from one twenty pew church to the next. My daddy's job was to stir the embers so that the people would not be found lukewarm and spit right out of the Lord's mouth on the day of judgment. When people ask if I know the Bible, I say, Darling, did Jesus bleed red ink on white paper? I know the good book better than I know my own children. All those years of hymn singing, sermon daydreaming, heat, faint, and hysteria have burrowed and twisted my guts so I can't find out where they end and I begin. My mother says the places we visited back then were backwater sinkholes spawning the worst that mankind has to offer ignoramuses and that their old-time religion was little more than a trinity of psychosis, spectacle, and superstition. True, but some part of you has got to admire a people willing to stand up on a wonky folding chair, waving a hanky and shouting, I ain't never been to a picture show or a ball game. Just pray I stay true and go all the way. My daddy anointed the sick with oil and cashed the checks on the way out of town. The smell of orange blossoms and swamp gas mixing in the night air. Us kids folded in the back seat like damp laundry. We zigged and zagged from the Atlantic to the Gulf until August of 1964 when we rolled into the little town of Lulu, Florida. The camp furthest out. A three-day extravaganza of preaching, prophesying, and car-warmed casseroles. A circus tent was set up in a fallow tobacco field just outside of town with a creek running along one side for baptizing and washing dishes. There weren't any designated parking areas. People just pulled their pickup trucks, station wagons, and sagging Chevys in willy-nilly, choosing spots near to where they planned to camp. The preaching had already started when we arrived. Jesus! Jesus! The Rose of Sharon! Jesus! Lily of the Valley! Firstborn, our high priest, sang, shouted the man on the plywood stage at one end of the tent, the light spilling through the striped awning the color of watery blood. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, when Jesus takes you by the hand, he doesn't let go. That day never let go of me. Sometimes a week or a month passes when I don't think on it, but sooner or later it comes back. It's funny how it always comes in sneaky. The first thing I see is not my mom up on the stage with that big silver microphone in one hand, a hand so small and thin I wonder how she managed to hold it to her lips. And it isn't my daddy's stunned gaze, the gaze of a bull, the split second the ball peen hammer comes down. No, it always starts with the angel man. I'd seen plenty of people slain in the spirit, seen them prophesy in heavenly tongues, and my mama kept a suitcase in the trunk full of medicines and eyeglasses, people tossed away in fits of belief. But I had never been as close to the veil separating this world from the next as when I walked under that tent, my hand in my sister's, since I was the baby of the family and never much for crowds. We'd come in through the side, as my daddy was to preach later that evening, and there was a special area roped off like a bullpen at a ball game. Preachers were pacing, warming up, hurling out scriptures like strikes, while their wives and children fanned themselves and gossiped in between timed hallelujahs for the home team. The man behind the pulpit had on a cream-colored suit with a cream-colored shirt and tie. He was all pale light, his hair golden spikes as the heat from the sun a million miles away freed it from its weight of lacquered brill cream. The drops of sweat that formed above his top lip evaporated into mist. While he was preaching, there must have been close to a hundred sinners up at the altar in front of the stage, wrestling with the Lord, just like Jacob did by the Jaffic River. 
and the sound of their travailing was like a mighty rushing wind. But the angel man's voice floated clear over their anguish till it filled the entire tent, his words siphoning through the cheap speakers with the static of a satellite far, far away. Has not the Lord God kept account of your wanderings, brothers and sisters? Are not your tears in his bottle? Are not their numbers in his book? The Oz were sighs. I finally had a name for everything in my life up to that point. The sheer sorrow of living took my breath away. Everyone in that tent was a sheep without a shepherd, a cry without a comfort, a people lost in the wilderness following a cloud and penance for everything ugly and small in this world. When the angel man finished, another took his place, and another, and another, all day long and into the evening they took turns, never losing the rhythm, like serenading prophets of old, singing and shouting until each one spent with Shekinah glory stepped down exhausted his shirt yellow with sweat his face red with strain the wound in the hollow of his thigh throbbing when it was my daddy's turn he climbed up the plank steps a thick finger between the pages of his bible he placed it open on the pulpit like he always did but it wasn't for reading he knew the bible instinctively just like he knew the secrets of a man's deepest desires he was a pied piper of dreams and sweet relief. Ten minutes in, my mother put her purse down on the straw beside her chair and climbed up the steps onto the stage. One of the ushers, thinking it was part of my daddy's stick, handed her a microphone shouting, We have a witness here, a witness! My daddy stopped preaching as my mother crossed the stage. The silence from behind the pulpit alone might account for the hush that moved through that tent like the promise of a summer storm. My mother took the microphone in one hand and then stretched the other out toward my father, a finger piercing his heart from ten paces out. She looked out over the people without seeing or hearing and said, I cannot live one more day with that queer. Someone in the crowd let out a hallelujah before the word queer coalesced with meaning. My mother walked from the stage, gathered her purse and went out and sat in the car. My daddy's face turned as white as the salt on Lot's wife. Every preacher joke he told a thousand times, every promise of deliverance, every prayer for healing was a stone too heavy for his arms of clay to lift. Turns out when we weren't driving from one revival to the next, my daddy acted as part-time chaplain over at the men's pr prison in Rayford. And increasingly over the years, the counseling sessions had begun taking on a more liberal interpretation of laying on of hands and anointing with oil. When my mother figured it out, I don't know, but my parents had an appointment with Truth in Lulu, Florida, and the freedom that Truth bought came at a high price, and we, all of us together, never again drove anywhere after that night. The tent let out a sigh. The people at the altar stopped wrestling with the angel of the Lord. Hankies went back into bosoms and a preacher dressed in black and gray brushed past my father in his hurry to take the stage. Slowly, the moans from those at the altar coughed back to life, taking on a keening like Esau's cry when he realized Jacob had stolen not only his birthright, but his father's blessing, and that the rest of his life on this earth would be a diminished thing. My sister took my brother's hand in one of hers and mine in the other, and we went and sat in the back seat of the car. The noise of creation drifting up from the creek and in through the open windows. I don't know who drove us home or where my daddy went after that night. All I can see when I try to remember is the angel man up on that stage, ripping the veil from top to bottom. I grew up in Florida before condos and Disney World, in a time when prophets roamed the mangroves and back roads, when a man just out of Bible college had to find a wife or be labeled queer, when a man who should have never have married my mother did so anyway, when my parents' tears overflowed God's bottles, ca carving out the limestone from under their feet and filling the nearby ocean with their salt. <laughs>